So what we're going to cover today is this. So we're going to cover hopefully all the high yield stuff from all these sections of the on the left hand side of the syllabus. So so sadly none of the none of the funky lect, um, essay based stuff. Um, but really that's the vestibular system, smell and taste, and sensory integration. In terms of your knowledge for your exams, I mean. I sat them a couple of years ago, but from what I can remember, basically the vestibular system and the smell and taste, they're really high yield questions. They're not normally too tricky um, and you can rattle through them, giving you time to tackle some of the other stuff. Sensory integration comes up a little bit less often. Um, maybe you need to know a little bit more about like neglect lesions, but um, it's really the first two topics that we'll we'll focus on in a little bit more detail. Um, I haven't, I don't think I've got a little plan slide for this so I'll just talk through what we're going to do so we'll, we'll go through them in order and then at the end of the vestibular system at the end of the smell and taste system we've got a couple of Socrative questions so these are all past exam questions or things we can remember from mocks or or things like that that I've asked my friends about so um, if nothing else hopefully there's two little sets of, uh, of MCQs will be of assistance to everyone so without further ado the vestibular system so this hopefully looks very familiar um, what do you need to know? Well, it's good to know that it's in the petrous part of the temporal bone. Um, there are four parts of the te temporal, but just learn petrous. Um, and the slightly weird snail-like looking thing at the bottom is the one to to um, to focus in on, really. Um, so obviously, this is the inner ear. Um, I think, I mean, hopefully, semicircular, semicircular canals and the um, otolith organs all look fairly familiar. The only bit that I didn't necessarily clock immediately when I was um, in year two is that the um, note that the utricle connects to the semicircular ducts and the saccule connects to the cochlea and that's important in some diseases as we'll see in a sec but that's really the the key bit of anatomy to take from this and then obviously the fact that they're sending signals via the vestibular cochlear nerve obviously another absolutely crucial point of information so um Breaking this down, um, so obviously we've got the semicircular canals that we'll talk about in a sec, but um, one of the, the key organs in the vestibular system are the otoliths. So that's utricle and saccule. So they're detecting linear acceleration and head position. Learn those two terms, please, because they come up in exam all the time. So the utricle connect, um, detects, roughly speaking, horizontal acceleration, and the saccule is pretty much vertical. Um, how does it do it? Hopefully these are familiar. It's these hair cells, which are actually Meccana receptors, and they have many stereocydia and one true kinocidium, um, and they polarise as um, they get shifted about. And it's a little bit like if you're driving in a car, someone slams on the brake and your body moves slower than when the car moves. So the car slows down before you do and you, relative to the car, move forward. So that's how the otolithic membrane is working here. Um, so that the otolithic membrane is you and the, the car are the hair cells. And what that's doing is pushing the hair cells one way or another, um, causing them to be either sort of excitatory or, or an inhibitory. And it's much the same method of working really in the semicircular canals. But here, the semicircular canals are detecting angular acceleration. So there's, there's three of them detecting three different angles, 3D space, it all makes sense. So um, you've got the horizontal superior and posterior. Um, and we've got these slightly funny terms that come from aviation, hence the plane. Um, so the horizontal is detecting rotation in the transverse plane. So that's sort of moving your head to the right or moving your head to the left, known as a yaw axis. The superior semicircular canal is detecting rotation in the sagittal plane. That's sagittal coming from Sagittarius, the archer, turning sideways on to fire the bow. Um, so that role is basically tilting your head, sort of if you're looking slightly confused at someone and your chin's going one way and your forehead's going the other way. Um, and the posterior semicircular canal is detecting rotation in the coronal plane, so coronal crown, I think about if you put on the crown, sort of rests on your temples, um, and that's your, your pitch axis, so that's you sort of nodding forward and backwards. Um, and as your head rotates, the endolymph lags, so the endolymph is the, the fluid filling um, the semicircular canals, um, and that's bending the hair cells on the cupola, which again, just like before, causes depolarization or hyperpolarization. Now, as I mentioned on the anatomy slide, where this can start to be a bit important is um, when you look at diseases such as vertigo. So vertigo can be caused by crystals, which are in the utricles. They line that otolithic membrane in the utricle and they dislodge. And we talked anatomically about how the utricle is connected to the semicircular canals. And these crystals can go into the semicircular canals and lodge there instead, depressing the hair cells there and effectively making you detect angular acceleration when it's not occurring. Um, 
and you can do something called a whole pipe test to detect it and an epi maneuver to, to to cure it and effectively what you're doing is rotating someone's head around rather fast um, and dislodging those crystals which makes the ENT surgeons an awful lot of money every year. So why is this important? Why is this in neuro? Well that's because the, the, the these, um, <laughs> these um, so, so, so. oh I can hear an echo Oh, it's gone now, perfect. Um, these semicircular clouds and, and otolith organs are sending signals via the vestibular cochlear nerve, uh, which is obviously one of the cranial nerves, um, through the internal auditory meatus, important thing to learn that, your entry cranial nerves, um, to the vestibular uh, nucleus. Um, and these are bipolar neurons that are transmitting this. Um, the vestibular nuclei, there's the sort of there's four subnuclei, medial, lateral, inferior, and superior, and they're all sending outputs via the vestibular spinal tract. So we mentioned that in yesterday's lecture, but there's the medial and lateral vestibular spinal tract. So the medial vestibular spinal tract is working on stabilizing head position during walking, which if you think about it, sort of makes sense intuitively. Um, you know, the vestibular organs, they're detecting the um, sort of acceleration of the head and it makes sense that they're then connecting to, to um, via the spine to uh, muscles that are going to then sort of keep your head on top um, but obviously it's not just the head that's important it's the whole body and that's where the lateral vestibular spinal tract comes into place um, and that lateral vestibular spinal tract um, sort of um, enacts a postural changes that are important for your body tilts as you're walking if that makes sense. Um, and all of this comes together as part of the vestibular spinal reflex, which is um, your body working to maintain your head in an upright position. So keeping your sort of your, sort of the top of your body in, the, in good posture. But probably the reflex you've heard a little bit more about and the one we're going to linger on for a couple of minutes today, because it's really important and there's loads of exam questions on it, is the vestibular ocular reflex. That's all the stuff in bold on the bottom right and the nice diagram we've got on the left. Um, and I really, really would recommend learning this. And I know it's an absolute bugbear, it's horrid, but this is this is an absolute classic big question. Um, so the vestibular ocular reflex or VOR, that's working to stabilize gaze during head movement. So you're focusing on a stimulus, but your head moves. You need to keep your eyes still trained on that stimulus. And that's what this is doing here. Um, and how it works is we've already talked about the projections from, from the vestibular organs to the vestibular nucleus and then from the, the outputs from the nuclei um, decussate, that means cross over to the nucleus abducens, where in the nucleus abducens you get two outputs. So one is directly to the lateral rectus muscle, which remember moves the eye laterally, the outwards to the sides, um, and another via the medial longitudinal fasciculus to the ocular motor nucleus and from there to the medial rectus which moves the eye in the other direction which makes sense right because you've got to coordinate both eyes movement together but this is an absolute classic so do do please learn the diagram um, that we've got on the left albeit not perhaps the latin names hopefully that makes sense to everyone right stuck come on there we go. Right. Um, one thing that's mentioned in your syllabus that can easily be confusing is this idea of nystagmus. So nystagmus is sort of I've defined as flickering eyes. Um, there's basically two types. You see here. So you've got physiological and pathological. So the physiological is what we've talked about. It's that vestibular ocular reflex. So it's you moving your head and your eyes sort of flickering back onto target as you move them absolutely normal we all do it it's brilliant necessary for our visual functioning but you've also got pathological nystagmus and it's important not to notice in a great amount of detail but just to be aware that you can subcategorize that into central and peripheral and um, um, central nystagmus you'd be thinking of damage to the cerebellum and peripheral nystagmus you'd be thinking of damage to the vestibular system which we've talked about before so it's just really important to have that awareness that a pathological nystagmus can be indicative of a, of a problem in the vestibular system now without further ado we've got five mcqs on socrative so i'm going to stop sharing for one sec hopefully ooh, sorry um hopefully you can all pop onto socrative and the the code is brockwell 4802 b-r-o-c-k-w-e-l-l 4802 which I shall put in the chat. So 
so we will crack on with our quiz. Da, 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 da. Vestibular system. Um, teach pace. Sorry, give me one sec. Um, OK, right. So hopefully the first question should emerge now. So the first question is, the otolith organ suture sac will detect angular acceleration of the head, true or false? OK, brilliant. OK, the vast majority are saying it's false. Yes, that, that's not true. It's linear acceleration they're detecting. Angular acceleration is the semicircular canals. And the way to sort of remember that is that there are three semicircular canals, which is important for the three different axes of head movement. Um, so there's more likely to be angular. We'll move on to question number two. So it's a bit of a tricky one, actually. I say all these questions are sort of the, the, the nasty ones I could think of. I've, so don't worry if it doesn't quite go to plan. Uh, but question number two is the section of the temporal bone contain, containing the vestibular apparatus. And the options are squamous, petrous, tympanic, mastoid, or the zygomatic process. OK, brilliant. Yeah, acing it. Well done, guys. Everyone who answered Petrus. Yeah, it's a, it's the Petrus or Petrus um, portion of the temporal bone. No easy way of remembering that. You've just got to learn it, I'm afraid. Um, question number three um, is another true or false. Sorry. Um, uh, that's endolymph fills the semicircular canals, utricle and saccule. Is that true or false? OK, amazing. Most of you spot on. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it's endolymph fills the semicircular canals, utricle and saccule. So that's so apologies. So that's true. Right. Question number four is um, what's the internuclear tract involved in the vestibulo ocular reflex? And the options are the tracts, the solitary nucleus, the medial vestibular spinal tract, lateral vestibular spinal, tectospinal or medial longitudinal fasciculus. Hopefully the right answers emerging. Um, if this all seems a bit confusing, um, there was a lecture yesterday on some of the tracks through the spine that will hopefully be on YouTube pretty soon. So maybe that would be a good little, little uh, provision um, topic to, to look up. OK, so, so a, a tough question initially and the answer a little bit less clear, but the majority have gone for medial longitudinal fasciculus. That's absolutely right. And last but not least, um the principal function of the vestibulo ocular reflex so just to say in your exam i mean um there can be a whole question on the vestibular organs and then a whole set of five and then a whole another set of five on the vor so that's why it's really good to be quite hot on questions for the vor because they're really really easy to ask people so examiners really love them oh amazing brilliant everyone's gone for stabilized gaze human movement absolutely correct um, and just I noticed in the chat, one person's put to central and peripheral nystagmus appear the same clinically, or can you determine the origin? So you can actually determine the difference. I don't think it's remotely relevant for preclinical, but um, there are a couple of different differences. But one of the key ones is that um, peripheral problems, so vestibular problems, tend to present with unidirectional nystagmus, whereas central, i.e. Um, cerebellar problems, often involves bidirectional nystagmus. So flickering in two ways. It's quite tricky to determine the difference, but neurologists get very good at it. OK, so we'll crack back on with moving through the presentation. Don't worry, we won't take the full hour. Um, I've tried to resist taking up 60 minutes of your time and instead focused on just doing the stuff that's absolutely, um, you know, gold dust for, for the exams. After all, it's a revision lecture. OK, so smell and taste, absolutely classic questions. They come up all the time in exams and they're really, really easy. It's all really straightforward, I promise you. So um, first of all, we've got smell. So chemoreceptors, which are in the nasal mucosa um, and they have an affinity for a range of odours. Um, they're what are detecting your smell, they're in your nose, and then they um, they, there are projections basically from the olfactory bulb, which you can see in the in the in the image in the middle, that basically project from the, they're on the bottom of the brain, but they're right over um, basically where the nose is. So they're right over the cribriform plate and they direct they project through 
uh, via the olfactory nerve, which is cranial nerve one. So that's a really important thing to know, cribriform plate, cranial nerve one. Um, and then projections from this olfactory bulb go straight to the primary olfactory cortex, which is in the temporal lobe. Now, a really important thing to know here, not necessarily neurologically speaking, but really important for your exams, is that there's no relay in the thalamus. That comes up all the time. Just be really aware that that's the case, because as you'll know, hopefully from your previous sensory lectures, that's really unusual. All the other um, sensations have this thalamic relay, whereas olfaction doesn't. Um, anyway, so primary olfactory cortex in the temporal lobe. It's not the most clearly defined. It's spread over a couple of areas. And then that has reciprocal connections with the hypothalamus and the secondary olfactory cortex, which is in the orbitofrontal cortex. Um, I won't linger on, on the sort of the importance of those couple of definitions. We're going to cover that tomorrow in the neuroanatomy lecture. But the key bits from here to know are the cribriform plate being the um, thing that cranial nerve one, the olfactory nerve, passes through, olfactory bulb, no relay in the thalamus, Temporal lobe is where the primary olfactory cortex is. Um, then we've got taste. So as hopefully you're aware, there are sort of five modalities you can taste, sweet, sour, salt, bitter, and umami, which is the proteins of taste. Um, and this is a bit funky because we've got two cranial nerves involved. So we've got um, cranial nerve seven, which is the facial nerve, which is the anterior two thirds of the tongue. And cranial nerve nine, which is the glossopharyngeal, which is the posterior one third of the tongue. And I said, I said the simple way of remembering that, of course, the anterior two thirds is closest to the face and um, the glossopharyngeal is closest to the, well, the pharynx. So it's all sort of logically named at the end of it. Anyway, these project um, to the nucleus of the solitary tract, um, which mediates a, a large number of reflexes. You will not need to know which reflexes it, it mediates, but just to have an awareness, it sort of makes sense that these um, things detecting things on the tongue are going to mediate things like the gag reflex, but there's an awful lot of, and the cough reflex, but there's an awful lot of other ones, um, of other reflexes that the nucleus of the solitary tract is, um, is controlling. Um, the other thing to know is how to identify it on a cross section. So you can see in the diagram at the bottom, we've got a cross section of the um, medulla oblongata, and you can see the nucleus of the tract of solitarius. Um, labelled in red, the nucleus of the solitary tract, and it's right at the top. But that's just something to be aware of because you can get these nasty questions when they point to a part of the medulla oblongata in cross section and ask you what it is. And the nucleus of the solitary tract is one you're expected to know. Anyway, here we're getting reciprocal connections from the not reciprocal connections, sorry, um, connections from the nucleus of the solitary tract towards the hypothalamus and also to the orbital frontal cortex. So you can remember in the previous slide, that's clear overlap with the processing of smell, which makes complete sense, right? Because smell and taste are both really important to be sort of combined when processing. Um, now, back onto Socrative, we've got five quick questions based on smell and taste. Um, as they all sort of nabbed from, from past exam questions that I can remember. So it's the same, if you give me one sec just to get it up, it's the same, um, code so it's brockwell 4802 just need to get the new launch the new quiz uh smell and taste next okay right so question number one is olfactory axons pass through the what And if you don't get this right, it was on a slide just two minutes ago. So, um, you know, you, if you fill out the feedback at the end, you get the slides, you can whiz over it pretty quickly. Absolutely brilliant. Well done, everyone. 100% cribriform plate, smashing stuff. Question number two, the primary olfactory cortex is located in which lobe? Parietal, frontal, occipital, temporal and insular. Which ones are going to be? This is one you've got to know for all the primary cortices. Um, just knowing exactly which part of the brain, or not exactly, but pretty accurately, exactly which part of the, the brain it is. Because once you learn it, they're super simple questions to answer. But if you don't know it, they're really tough ones to guess. Um, OK, brilliant. Well done. Nearly everyone, temporal lobe. Absolutely. Question number three um, is a true false. Um, the olfactory pathway does not involve a thalamic relay. OK, brilliant. Well, everyone, that's absolutely that's true. true. Um, great, brilliant. It does come up in questions. It came up in our exam, obviously not as a true false, but it's just a really crucial, important uh, thing of importance to know. Um, just have that kicking around the back of your mind come exam day. 
Right, number three, no, sorry, number four, my apologies. Uh, cranial nerves conveying taste information terminate in where? Nucleus of the solitary tract, red nucleus, medial or lateral geniculate nucleus, or the hypothalamus. Hey, Brillo, well done, everyone. Nucleus of the solitary tract, smashing, you're doing a great job. And number five, the middle third of the tongue is innervated by the facial nerve, true or false? So a bit of a bit of a nasty one this because we can all remember the facials at the front and glossopharyngeals at the back but can you remember what happens in the middle there where's the split brilliant words and everyone doing a better job than i did in your, uh, at your stage yeah the middle third's facial because the facial is, is innovating the anterior two thirds well done right we'll finish that up back on to the slides we're whizzing through this which i think is all good stuff you get to get to dinner early and all that jazz um right how do i share ba, 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 ba. right sorry guys i'm starting to this up how do I share? There we go. Brilliant. Right. Should we back on this? So that's the advantage. Right. So sensory integration. So it's lower yield for exams. So we're going to whiz through it. Um, it's one of these things that you need to know in a lot more detail if you want to be writing essays. But if it's just bashing out the part A's, which after all are the things where most people fall down upon, um, we can whiz through this fairly, fairly promptly, maybe even be done for almost half past. OK, so. The, the three places, three things you need to know about, sorry, previous page, um, are the superior colliculus, the posterior parietal cortex, and the prefrontal cortex. So, superior colliculus, where is it? It's here. So, it's, you can see on the diagram, it's at the top, it's the, it's, it's sort of these, these back lumps that you have behind the cerebral aqueduct um, in, in the brainstem. Um, and it's where you're getting auditory and visual integration and that's really the key thing to take from this is just um your awareness of superior colitis from in some terms needs to more be eliminating it as a potential answer from other options than it is necessarily actively choosing it but the important thing to know is it's auditory and visual integration how how does that happen well you get inputs from the retina and visual cortex auditory visual and somatosensory systems that all sort of makes sense i think um within the superior colitis like an awful lot of the brain you have these motion sensory topographical maps um, and you've got auditory and visual topograph uh, topographic maps um, and from the superior colliculus you can then get these outputs towards um, uh, um, sort of orientating these sensory structures towards the stimuli that they need to focus on. An, an example of how they do that um, is um, something called a saccade which is a quick jump movement of, of both eyes um, we sort of talked about nystagmus as well, but um, saccadic eye, eye movements are, are physiological um, shifts in, in, eye, in eye movements. So rather than sort of a slow scan from left to right, this is when you're jumping straight from right to focus on, on, on something important. Um, so that's the superior colliculus. But yeah, really, I suppose the catchphrase is auditory and visual integration. That's what you need to take away from this, and also to be able to identify it anatomically. Then we've also got the posterior parietal cortex. I haven't included um, a map because obviously it's fairly obvious where it is. This is the posterior of the parietal cortex. And um, the thing to take from this is it's getting input from an awful lot of areas. So visual, somesthetic, auditory, motor, limbic, the wear stream. You're probably not going to be asked exactly about where it's coming from, but basically a huge amount of brain input. And what it's doing is it's directing attention. It's involved in movement. It's involved in speech and reading. And sort of fairly self-explanatory, then there are outputs to the frontal cortex and then these motor areas, the basal ganglia and cerebellum. When's it going to come up in, the, in your exams? Well, it's going to come up with regards to lesions in the area. So we've talked about what it does. So it sort of makes sense that then it's going to be involved in the Gleck syndrome and acquired dyslexia. So acquired dyslexia, it's sort of, you've got that, um, you know, you've got the reading function, that makes sense. Neglect, hopefully you've all come across before, but that's a slightly funky thing where, um, you, you can draw two houses, one can have a fire on it, um, and people won't be able to tell you that there's a fire there in one of the houses, but they will be able to always choose that they'd rather live in the one without the fire. So in other words, you can, you, you're, you can see everything, but you're not paying attention um, to, to one half of your, your visual input. So people might be half dressed, 
So, you know, um, they've done all the buttons up on one side, but not on the other side. Or, you know, one side's very scrunchy. One side of their clothes are very scrunchy, but the other side isn't. That's where you're getting your neglect syndrome. And that's where these, well, that's where the posterior parietal cortex is going to come up in your exams. And last but not least, we've got the prefrontal cortex. Um, so that's the stuff right at the front, um, obviously, prefrontal cortex. And its functions are things like working memory, um, intention, decision, the stuff that sort of makes us us as such. And it has these reciprocal connections with the limbic system, the visual system, and the basal ganglia. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to see that. Um, and you, you might remember um, with the, the PFC, that story of Phineas Gage, who sort of turned to ungodly behaviour because he had a big um, railroad rod that went through his PFC. Um, but yeah, that's that sort of, um, yeah, the prefrontal cortex. I think, yeah, the way to think about it is this sort of, um, this real sort of hub of hub of personality of the decisions that you're making of, of what makes you you. And that, hopefully, is that. That's where we've ended. So hopefully that was useful. Please do feed up, feed, uh, fill out the feedback form if you get a chance. And then if you like my slides, you can get them. Really, I was just trying to give you a super simple part A based um, overview of uh, those three sections. And if you enjoyed that, or even if you didn't, and you feel slightly less weak on neuroanatomy, we're covering all half of neuroanatomy, which will take longer than half an hour, I'm afraid, um, tomorrow at exactly the same time. But thank you very much for turning up.